percent since I uh, sold my practice really started about five and a half years ago in September of 2017 when my wife and I, Trina, she's right there, uh, we were on a biking cruise. It was a two-week biking cruise. And anytime I go on a vacation, I always read a health and nutrition book because I've had this anti-aging center all these years. And I've read well over 300 books on health and nutrition. So I went onto Kindle and this book, How Not to Die by Michael Greger popped up. And I don't know how many of you have ever read it. It's about two inches thick and about an inch of it are scientific references. And as a medical doctor, that is what really intrigued me about this book. And as I was going uh, through the book, the science was showing over and over again that cultures and research cohort groups that ate more plant-based had much lower incidence of cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, type two diabetes, really all cause uh, mortality. And then he got into the blue zones these are the five areas of the world where people live the longest. Uh, and I always like to kind of focus on Loma Linda because it's the same culture. It's right in uh, California. That's where the Seventh day Adventists kind of live. Uh, they don't drink alcohol. Most of them are vegans or vegetarians due to their religious beliefs. Women live about 10 years longer than their American counterparts, and men actually live about 14 years longer. Mm. And you'll find that they have about 500% more centenarians, people that make it over 100. And also, when their descendants move, uh, they lose about 17 years uh, off of their uh, lifespan. Now, all of these countries eat about 90 to 95% plant-based when you start analyzing uh, their diets. We do know that the National Cancer Institute recommends nine servings of fruits and vegetables for the prevention of cancer. Uh, the way they came up with that recommendation is that once again, the science shows over and over again that cultures and research cohort groups that eat more plant-based have much lower incidence of, of cancer. Um, so I'm on this cruise and I tell my wife, I say, Trina, I'm going to start eating whole food plant-based. And she thought I was crazy because we had all this meat and dairy and desserts. And, um, but I'm one of these people, I'm type A. When I decide I'm going to do something, I just go ahead and do it 100%. So September of 2017, I started to go whole food plant-based, and I've been whole food plant-based ever since. So I came home uh, the last week of September, and uh, I was doing surgery, and I felt a little pop in my right collarbone. And I, I didn't think a lot of it, but it just kept getting worse and worse. And I, by the end of October of 2017, it was starting to keep me up at night. And I remember telling Trina, I said, Trina, I think I have bone cancer. And she thought I was crazy because you're the healthiest guy I know. You don't have bone cancer. And I kind of sloughed it off. And then about a week and a half later, it was November 10th, 2017. It was Sunday. We're watching television. I accidentally knocked over a container of water. I lunged for it and my bone just cracked right in half. I went to the RG Care Center, and this is actually my x-ray. Um, so I went to a friend of mine who's an orthopedic doctor. He said, hey, we need to take an MRI. And then he, uh, he called me uh, the Friday after the Sunday that this happened. He goes, hey, Nick, my nickname's Nick. He said, Nick, I, I hate to tell you, but I, you, you have a tumor in there. Um, so they did um, a bunch of tests. Uh, they did a biopsy, a bunch of blood tests, and they found out I had what's called multiple myeloma, which is an incurable blood cancer. It's a cancer of the B cells. They're the cells that make your antibodies. And there's three basic types of myeloma. There's IgA, IgG, and IgM. If you go on the internet, you type in IgA myeloma. That's the most aggressive type of myeloma. So my oncologist wanted to put me on this triple regimen, two oral medications, and then another medication called Valcade, which is a proteasome inhibitor, where I would have to go into the hospital every week and get injections into my abdomen. And the more I uh, studied about this Valcade, almost everybody that gets it gets a very severe peripheral neuropathy of their fingers and their feet. So they kind of lose nerve function of those. And because I'm a surgeon, I really was very hesitant about that. And remember, at this point, I had already been eating whole food plant-based for two months. 
So my doctor wanted to put me on this triple regimen. I said, doc, I'm not doing that Valcade. And he was very upset with me. Uh, he said, hey, I don't think you're going to get into a complete remission just doing those two oral medications. But I, I stuck to my guns. I told him I'm not doing it. And at that point, I went on a deep dive of the scientific literature. So every morning I would wake up and I, I would spend three to four hours just researching every possible thing that I could do, lifestyle, diet, herbs, uh, that I could help me get into a complete remission with this type of cancer. So every month, my numbers just kept getting in better and better. And by the sixth month, I was in a complete remission. And my doctor was kind of blown away. First off, he didn't even think I was going to get into a complete remission. Then I got there in six months. Um, and that's really um, when I started to, uh, about a year after I started my treatment, I gave a lecture at one of the hotels. I had about 125 people show up, which I was amazed. And that's the only time I've ever had a standing ovation in my life. Um, hopefully, you guys are going to give me one. Um, but, um, but there were a lot of cancer patients there. And I think the reason they gave me a standing ovation, it really, they either, it was either they felt sorry for me, the lecture was good, but I think the reason was a lot of the cancer patients felt that they were at the mercy of the surgery, the chemo, the radiation. In fact, afterward, a lot of people came up to me afterward. I remember one lady had what I have, multiple myeloma, and, and she was definitely overweight. She said, I, you know, I asked my oncologist, should I change my diet or anything? And he said, oh, no, just keep eating the way you're eating. You'll do just fine. And she told me, I knew that wasn't right. That just, oh. I just knew instinctively that that couldn't be right. So anyway, um, I went on to develop a website called Natural Insights into Cancer. I have an Instagram site. I have over 36,000 followers. I do a post every day. And I decided to write this book because everybody kept telling me, hey, you need to write a book because you have all this information. We were having monthly meetings at one of my med spas. Becky used to go there. And they were great. I used to have uh, speakers come in. So I wrote a book. I, have it, I had it on Amazon in November of 2019. And the, the precepts in my book are basically a whole food plant-based diet. I personally take over 30 different herbal supplements. I don't expect most cancer patients to do that. Like I said, I'm type A personality. Um, exercise is really super important. We'll get into that. Getting adequate sleep and stress reduction. Um, exercise is really the kingpin. Um, these, this study is one of many uh, with breast cancer. And in this study, they had uh, women in different exercise type groups. So women that just briskly walked every day for 30 minutes with breast cancer, they lowered their relapse rate by 24%. Women that kind of ran, like jogged a little bit for two thirds of a mile, lowered their relapse rate by 40%. And women that jogged 2.3 miles per day lowered their chance of relapse by 95%. Chemo drugs don't do that. So exercise has this amazing, uh, amazing immune boosting effect in your body. In fact, in my book, I, sh I show how just six minutes of exercise actually jacks up your natural killer cell activity by 50%. So you don't have to do half hour or an hour, even if you do six minutes, it's gonna make a huge difference. And I recommend doing, um, I saw they were doing some resistance training here and I think that's really important. And I, I love that this church actually promotes health because a lot of them, they have parties afterward, people were eating hot dogs and french fries and you know, like they're, they, they want the temple of the Lord to be healthy and they want you to be in a good mood but they're teaching you how to eat all this crappy food. So, um, but resistance training is very important because as we get older, we lose about a pound of muscle every year if we're not doing resistance training. As your muscle de de deteriorates, your insulin sensitivity goes down, your insulin levels go up, and insulin is a very powerful cancer growth stimulator. We don't want high insulin levels. So phytochemicals or phytonutrients are really the chemicals in plant foods that are the anti-cancer powerhouses. And when you look at a label, you'll never see them there. You'll just see you know, vitamins, minerals, electrolytes. Um, phytochemicals are what give plant foods uh, their color. 
uh, the reds, the greens, the purples. And the, we know there's over 100,000 phytonutrients in plant foods. I, I just listened to a podcast by uh, Jed Fahey. He's one of the premier experts on phytonutrients. And he feels there's over 5 million phytochemicals in plant foods. We've only studied about 150 of them. And when we do study them, they all have these similar characteristics. They have antioxidant activity, very powerful anti-tumor activity, anti-inflammatory activity, and they have this amazing ability to affect the way that your genes are expressed. We call this epigenetics. And this slide um, kind of demonstrates this. If you, go, if you go down five words, you'll see curcumin, that's turmeric. Uh, personally, I think everybody in this room should take turmeric. It's the most amazing supplement. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. But if you fall, go all the way up to the top, it says BRCA1. BRCA is a DNA repair gene in the breast tissue. Uh, Angelina Jolene made that famous. Um, so that protects you from breast cancer. So curcumin actually upregulates the BRCA gene. It makes that DNA repair work better. If you follow all the way down to the bottom, you'll see P53 with an MUT. That's a mutated P53 gene. That's a proto-oncogene. So proto-oncogenes actually protect you from cancer, but when it gets mutated, it actually makes the cancer more aggressive. So the curcumin actually down-regulates the P53. This was a landmark study by Dean Ornish it was published in the Journal of Urology uh, in about, I think it was 2006. They took two groups of people that have early prostate cancer. They broke them into two groups. One was a plant-based group, the other ate the standard American diet, followed them for a year. They measured their PSA levels. It's a biomarker for prostate cancer. And they found that the people that were eating plant-based, their PSA levels came down 4%. The people that were eating the standard American diet, it actually went up 6%. And what they found also is they wanted to see um, how the uh, genes were affected. And they, they used heat map technology for this. And they found that 48 good genes were made upregulated, they worked better, and 453 bad genes were downregulated, which is fascinating. Then what they did, has anybody ever heard of the telomeres? Telomeres are the little caps on the end of your chromosomes. And as you age, they get shorter and shorter and shorter, and then we basically die. Um, uh, so in this study, um, so what, we, what, what they did in this study, they looked at these same patients five years later. And he did this work with Elizabeth Blackburn. She's kind of the last name on that list there. She won the Nobel Prize on her work in telomeres. And what they found is the people that were eating plant-based, their telomeres actually got a little longer. And the people that were eating standard American diet, the telomeres got much, much shorter. So that was fascinating. So now we're gonna talk about the antioxidant power of these phytonutrients. We experience oxidation on a day-to-day -day basis, our cars rust. You can see this penny kind of rusting, but we have trillions of oxidation reactions that occur on a daily basis in our mitochondria just through energy production. So what happens is these mitochondria release these free radicals. They are molecules with an unpaired electron. And if you remember from your chemistry class, electrons do not like to be unpaired. They want to find a paired uh, electron. And in the process, they will damage cellular membranes, they'll damage your DNA, they'll damage proteins. Um, we have three innate antioxidants in each one of our cells, uh, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and superoxide dismutase. And they pretty much keep most of our free radical activity under control, but we can overload the system by all these ways that you can see here. Cigarette smoking is probably the worst. In fact, I read an article one time, one puff of a cigarette creates eight hours of free radical activity. And I think the way most of us overload our system is the standard American diet. The average American is getting about 60% of their food from ultra processed foods. That's probably the worst thing you can do. 32% uh, from animal products and about 10% from plant foods. And that's counting French fries and ketchup as a plant food, believe it or not. So, um, 
So our diet is pretty pathetic, and only 3% of Americans are getting 25 grams of fiber. If you look at the uh, N. Haynes report, 0% of men, 30 to 50 years of age, get 25 grams of fiber. So men are the worst. Uh, they have the worst diet. When you go into a restaurant, you'll see women eating salads, but you'll never see men doing that. They're eating their, bur they're eating their burgers or their big steaks, whatever. So anyway, you have all these free radicals, uh, if you have excess, they're going to damage your cellular membranes, your DNA, uh, proteins, enzymes throughout your system. So as we get older, we all accumulate DNA mutations. I mean, that's basically how all of us age. Um, you get more and more DNA mutations, and you really can't totally eliminate it on an average day. We get about 19,200 hits to our DNA. Thankfully, as we sleep, and that's why sleep is extremely important, that's when a lot of that DNA repair goes on. Um, uh, there's a lot of autophagy where your body's actually you know, cleaning up a lot of the debris. Uh, in a typical day, um, we clean up, and I'll get into that, a lot of cells that commit actually cell suicide. So what happens is we have all these free radicals that we haven't totally uh, neutralized. They damage the proto-oncogene. Remember that P53 that we talked about before? That's supposed to protect you from cancer. It's a tumor suppressor gene. But when you get so many DNA mutations of that, it actually becomes an activated oncogene. So instead of protecting you, it actually makes the cancer more aggressive. Um, when I first got diagnosed, uh, I read this article in Nature. Uh, it's, a, it's a famous scientific journal. And, Mikkel Munchke is a famous myeloma researcher. And when I read this, I really got depressed, to be quite honest with you. Um, and in the article, it said, when you get diagnosed with what I have, you have about 5,000 DNA mutations in that cancer cell. And by the time you relapse, you're up to 12,000. And I think one of the reasons you get all those DNA mutations is from the drugs that you take. For instance, those two medications I take, I know for a fact that they create DNA mutations in me, and that's why I really try to keep them to a minimum. Minimum. So when I do cancer lifestyle coaching, one thing I always do is I try to get people to eat as many plant foods as they can because plants have 63 times the antioxidant power compared to animal products. And remember, antioxidants are what neutralize those free radicals. So if you look on the right. If you look at the complete right, that's a standard American diet. Person wakes up, they have bacon and eggs in the morning, they have a Big Mac for lunch, at dinner they have a steak. I gave a little parsley for some extra uh, antioxidants. Um, so the whole day they have 44 ORAC units. So ORAC units are the way that we measure the ability of a food to neutralize free radicals. If you look on the left, that's one sweet potato with a teaspoon of cinnamon. I put cinnamon on everything and then a pinch of clove. Clove is the most potent herb on the face of the earth. So just that one food, we have 246 ORAC units. And it's crazy. These are five standard American breakfasts on the left. These are ORAC units. That's just one smoothie with some AMLA powder in there. AMLA is the most potent antioxidant fruit on the face of the earth. So I always have my cancer patients either do AMLA capsules or put them in their smoothie because they have this amazing antioxidant power. Now, what we have to remember is that growth hormone is needed for us to become adults. But the way God made us is as we get older, our growth hormone levels get less and less and less and less. And the reason God did that is because, remember, as we're getting older, we're getting more and more DNA mutations. You don't want a growth stimulator in the environment of a lot of DNA mutations. That's a perfect setup for getting cancer. And what's interesting, uh, if you keep your IGF-1, your insulin growth factor one levels lower, you actually get more and more uh, apoptosis. So in an average day, you have about 50 to 70 billion cells that commit suicide. It's called cell suicide. And it, and it does that because the, the cell is starting to turn into a tumor or it's getting senescent. So the body sends a signal, hey, get rid of this cell. We have about 37 trillion cells in our body. But when your IGF-1 levels are lower, you have less DNA mutations, and you have a lot more of the cell suicide that gets rid of all of these cells that may turn into uh, tumors. 
One of the things that we do know is that when you eat animal protein, and it's mainly due to the branched amino acids in animal products, it sends a signal to the liver that growth is going to occur, and the liver starts manufacturing this IGF-1. We do know, if you look up in the right-hand corner, there's a group of dwarfs in Peru. They're called the Loran dwarfs, and they can't make IGF-1. They, they have a genetic deficiency. There has never been a reported case of a Loran dwarf ever getting cancer. And when you go into the scientific literature, high IGF-1 levels in adults is definitely correlated with uh, cancer growth. So we really need to keep those down. What's really interesting, if you eat a whole food plant-based diet for 11 days, you actually can lower your IGF-1 levels by 20%. It can happen that quickly. And when they do studies looking at people eating standard American diets versus more of a whole food plant-based diet, IGF-1 levels are way lower. I do IGF-1 testing through my uh, cancer lifestyle practice. Uh, people go on my website, and they can sign up. I do it through Quest. I try to keep the IGF-1 levels between uh, 120 and 160. Studies show that's kind of the ideal range to keep cancer growth to a minimum. There's another growth factor promoter called mTOR. It's a protein kinase. Once again, when you're younger, you need it because you need to turn into adult. But as you get older, once again, you don't want a growth stimulator in the environment of increased DNA mutations. If you look up to the left, you'll see leucine. That is a branched amino acid that's in high levels in animal products. That is a stimulator of mTOR. And if you look at foods that have high leucine, they're all animal products. Most plant products have very low leucine levels. So if you have cancer, you definitely want to keep your leucine levels down. So how do these plant chemicals fight cancer? These are just eight different ways. There's a lot more ways. I have them all detailed in my book. Uh, it fragments cancer cell DNA. It disrupts, we know, at least 80 plus cancer cell signaling pathways. It inhibits new blood vessel growth so that the cancer can't metastasize. It disrupts the replication of the cancer cells. Uh, it increases your uh, chemo and radiation sensitivity. It helps decrease chemo resistance, increases cancer cell suicide, and it activates your tumor suppressor genes. And there's a lot more ways that it works. But the thing that's fascinating about these plant chemicals is they work synergistically. So two plus two doesn't equal four. Two plus two equals seven. And I'm gonna go through a bunch of studies in the scientific literature that really are quite mind-blowing. Um, this is one um, where they took breast cancer cells that were growing in a Petri dish. They applied a grape extract. The grape extract killed about 25% of the cancer cells. Then they applied an onion extract that killed about 50%. So if you did a half and half solution, you would figure it would kill what, like 35%. No, it killed 75%. So there was synergy wow. among those plant chemicals. Same article, they did four different fruits. Same thing, the top bar is the anti-cancer activity when they were all combined, so it's pretty incredible. Uh, this is another study uh, that looked at the antioxidant power of azuki beans uh, and raspberries. And you would think if you put them together, that's what it would be, but no, when you combine them, the antioxidant power is actually synergistic, which is quite amazing. This study looked at carotenoids. So they looked at curcumin, uh, tomato extract, and vitamin E. And if you look, vitamin E actually had a negative effect on the cancer. The cancer actually grew more. The higher the bar, this was against prostate cancer cells, the greater the anti-cancer activity. And you can see when you combine the three, the anti-cancer activity magnified, that's at least 10 times. I mean, it's, it's really quite amazing. And same study, these were three different phytonutrients. The green is the synergistic effect when you added them all together. Uh, this was an interesting study done in Cornell. Um, what they wanted to find, what were the, the, the 10 most common fruits and what was the anti-cancer power of each of the fruits? And what they found was that cranberries actually had the most potent anti-cancer activity. Uh, then you can see it was lemons, it was kind of apples, uh, uh, strawberries, and then grapes. Uh, and then kind of up the line. Uh, because of that, 
Every morning, uh, I add 12 different freeze-dried powders to my morning coffee. I do an organic light roast coffee. I actually get it at Costco. My wife gets a big box of it. Um, but what I want you to look at is the blueberry powder. You see where it says 50 to one? So what that means is one gram of freeze-dried blueberry powder is like eating 50 grams of blueberries. So when I do this in the morning, and I do it in a fasted state, and we're gonna be talking about that a little later, I mean, I consider it like I'm, I don't have nothing in my stomach, it's like getting a chemo infusion to me um, because of the antioxidant and the, and the anti-tumor activity of these. So this is what I use, if you look up on the top, I use a 24 ounce LO coffee cup. The powders get me up to the top of that gray area, then I uh, basically, the coffee gets me about halfway, and then I do about a cup of soy milk, um, and then I throw it in the microwave. Now one of the things I always do, if you look at the baking powder, I always add baking powder to my coffee because coffee is very acidic. And one of the things I do with all of my cancer patients, I try to get them their pH leaning more alkaline. Your body will keep your pH between 7.35 and 7.45 through your kidneys, but I like patients leaning as much as possible towards 7.45. So they all get this chart. This chart's actually in my book. And I like them to start off eating about 70% on the left side and 30% on the right side, which is acidic. Um, every night before I go to bed, I eat watermelon and pineapple. Uh, that's way over here, that's the most alkaline. Uh, I also put pumpkin seeds on all my salads, that's most alkaline. So I tell people, put it on your refrigerator, try to memorize as much as you can. Um, now one of the things I do is, and if you look at the studies, um, when the microenvironment of cancer is more acidic, the cancer tends to metastasize. Uh, cancer loves an acidic microenvironment. When you alkalinize it, the cancer has a hard time surviving and metastasizing. So that's why keeping yourself more alkaline is important. I have all my patients go on Amazon. You can get these pH hydrian strips of Amazon, like six bucks. So every morning when I wake up, I keep that right actually on my toilet. I pee on it first thing in the morning. So, um, so I'm always, I will tell you, I'm always like really super green because I've been doing this for so long. I mean, I'm super alkalinized. And when I do that pineapple and watermelon before I go to bed, I know I'm gonna wake up, it's gonna be greener than hell. So, uh, so that's how I do that. Now, so my goals with cancer patients, I wanna keep them alkalinized. I want to lower the inflammation, so we know a plant-based diet is very anti-inflammatory, and I also want to increase the oxygen content, because oxygen loves a hypoxic microenvironment. It loves low oxygen because it actually metabolizes anaerobically. The best way to increase your oxygen in the cancer microenvironment is through exercise, and there's been many studies that show that. So, you know, you don't have to go for fancy ozone treatments and hyperbaric. Just get out there and do some exercise. So. Now, this study is amazing. It was in cancer prevention research. And what they did is they took uh, people that have early esophageal cancer. And for any of you that are familiar with esophageal cancer, it is the second most deadly cancer next to pancreatic cancer. So they took these patients and they put them on a quarter cup of freeze-dried strawberry powder. And that's all they did. They didn't change their diet or anything. And what they found was, and they, they proved all this with endoscopy, with photography, 80.6% of the patients at least had reversal of this early esophageal cancer. And 50% had complete elimination of this early esophageal cancer. That's mind blowing. So that just shows you the power of these phytonutrients. And these people didn't even change their diet, which if you change your diet and you do this, you're getting this amazing uh, anti-cancer punch. So when you do a smoothie, you know, put as many different fruits and vegetables in there. You want to get take advantage of the, of the synergy. If you don't do coffee like I do, you could throw some of those powders uh, in your coffee and get this extra antioxidant punch. And all of them I get on Amazon. Uh, a bag is like about 20 bucks. It'll last you for like three months. So, um, so don't waste your money on that balance of nature because you get a little capsule. That is freeze-dried powder. 
but you're just getting such a small amount. I mean, you can do a whole like tablespoon of a freeze dried powder and you're getting like 10 times as much uh, of these phytochemicals. This was another study that was done at Cornell, uh, the same ones that did the one on the fruit. They wanted to find what are the anti-cancer activities of the 10 most common nuts. And they found that pecans and walnuts were the most potent. And then if you look, it's uh, peanuts, almonds, and then cashews, and then kind of up the line. Um, and what's interesting, this is a different study on the antioxidant power of different nuts. And what they found was pecans and walnuts also had the highest antioxidant activity. So what I've learned through my study is that foods that have the highest antioxidant activity also have the most potent anti-cancer activity. And if you, uh, if you look at some of the work that was done by Dr. Keith Block through molecular probe technology, cancer cells have very high iron and copper levels. They, they just accumulate that in the cell because they need it to replicate and also to metastasize. When an when a antioxidant gets into the cancer cell in the presence of high iron and copper, it actually turns into a free radical through what's called the Fenton reaction. And it kills the cancer cell. That's why you've probably heard of people getting IV vitamin C. That's how it works. Uh, so the antioxidant actually turns into a free radical and that's how it kills the cancer cell. Now I get in debates with a lot of oncologists because Lenore, you probably experienced this when you uh, get chemo, the doctor will say, don't take any supplements when you get your chemo. And I will tell you, if, and I really do think it's a knee-jerk reaction. I don't, think they're, I don't think they've done any real research on it. This was a study that was done by Keith Block's group. Uh, they looked at 965 different studies. It was a meta-analysis. And what they found was that people that did supplementation with their chemo, they actually did much better. Uh, they had less side effects. They were able to finish their chemo treatments. And there's another study I have in my book. It was a meta-analysis of 280 studies and it showed the exact same thing. And, and when I get, and sometimes I'll get into uh, arguments with oncologists. And I, I always bring this up, this Amagen. Amagen is an FDA approved IV extremely powerful antioxidant that they give to patients, for instance, when they get radiation, and it protects the normal cells. And they ran many, many clinical trials to be able to get FDA approval. And what they showed when the FDA did all these trials, it had no negative effect on the final outcome, and it did protect the normal cells. So anytime I get an argument with an oncologist, I always bring this study up because like, it pretty much shuts them up when I, when I discuss that. So what I do, and I am a little type A, I told you that. So before I take my supplements in the morning, so I fast actually 16 hours uh, every day. I eat my last food at eight, and I don't eat until noon. And uh, before I do that, I actually take 12 different nuts. I do like two pecans, I do two walnuts, two hazelnuts, I do a few peanuts, some pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. Why do you think I do that instead of grabbing a bunch of like pecans or something? Synergy. Synergy. I want to take advantage of the synergy. So I want as many different nuts as possible. And I do recommend taking some kind of fat before you take supplements uh, because your fat soluble vitamins and phytonutrients will not be absorbed if you don't have some fat uh, in your body. So I always. That's kind of how I start off my day. I do these nuts. Um, I've had people say, well, you're just applying these extracts onto these you know, growing breast cancer cells, whatever. Um, do, do these phytonutrients really get into your blood? So in this study, what they did is they took two groups. They fed one group all these walnuts, <laughs> and they fed this other group no walnuts. And then they took their blood, and they dripped them on growing breast cancer cells. And what happened is that the blood of the walnut eaters like decimated these cancer cells and the people that weren't eating the walnuts nothing happened uh, to the cancer cells so the point I want to make with this just remember whatever you eat those nutrients or those detrimental chemicals maybe those additives or toxins that you're putting into your body I mean they're getting into every nook and cranny of your body so every time you put something in your mouth or what you're drinking Always be thinking, is it helping me or is it hurting me? Especially if you're battling cancer. You do not want to be putting anything that's going to hurt your body. 
Now, this next study is one of the most important studies. I show it to every cancer patient. And in this study, they took 34 different food extracts and they applied it to seven different cancers. I only have six of them here. But what I want you to, and it's kind of, this got kind of fuzzy because they actually took photos of this. I actually had a lot of animation in this uh, slide show. But, um, but over here is bok choy, way on the left for medulloma, uh, 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 medulloma blastoma. And if you look at bok choy, it basically changes. So the higher the bar, the less potent the anti-cancer activity. The shorter the bar, the more potent the anti-cancer activity. Two things I always want cancer patients to learn from this. The yellow highlighted foods are your allium vegetables. That's your onion, garlic, leeks. Your green highlighted are your cruciferous vegetables. That's like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, arugula, radish. If you notice, the allium and the cruciferous are always on the right side of every single chart. So what I tell people that have cancer, you really need to be consuming some allium vegetables and cruciferous vegetables every single day wow. uh, because it's really important. The other thing that I want people to learn from this, if you look at bok choy, it kind of moves all over the place, <laughs> is that you need to eat a variety of different foods because you really don't know what food is going to have the most anti-cancer activity against the specific cancer that you have. So you need to eat variety. So when I eat a salad, um, this is a salad I get at Whole Foods, and, and one time I showed this to all my patients, and they go, how many vegetables are there? I didn't even know. So one day I actually counted them. How many vegetables do you think are in there? Three. Three. Twenty-five oh. vegetables in there. So what I, what, I tell, what I tell patients is, when you make a salad, just don't put leafy greens and maybe some carrots, onions, and tomatoes. Like put two broccoli, two cauliflower, mm -hmm. a couple of cucumbers, a couple of radish, put some peas, put some corn in there. Put as many different vegetables as you can to take advantage of that, that synergistic effect. So synergy also occurs with teas. This is a, a tea concoction that I developed. I have them all uh, in my book. Um, so what I do around seven o'clock, I make that coffee. I do all my computer work in the morning. I'm kind of sipping that as I do that. Then when I get ready in the morning, uh, I actually sip this tea concoction. And all of these are scientifically referenced in my book. <laughs> Dandelion root, by the way, is the most potent tea, antioxidant tea. So we learned higher the antioxidant activity, the higher the cancer anti-cancer activity. Um, now. I do intermittent fasting. I personally eat my last food around eight and I don't eat until 12 because studies show that when you intermittently fast, it really has an amazing uh, effect on cancer growth. So this was one of the first studies, it's actually in my book, where they took breast cancer patients, they broke them into two groups. One fasted 13 hours or more, the other group fasted 13 hours or less. And that's really not that hard to do. Um, the group that fasted greater than 13 hours had a 36% lower relapse rate compared to the people that fasted less than 13 hours. So what happens when you fast is your body really has a chance to do tumor surveillance. It's doing DNA repair. Remember we told that, like fixing all these DNA mutations. It's, it's undergoing autophagy where it's cleaning up a lot of misfolded proteins, a lot of those cells that committed suicide, it's cleaning up all that debris, getting rid of it. So you really need your body to kind of focus just on healing, and that's why intermittent fasting works really well. So I eat all my food within an eight hour window uh, every day, and I do think that's beneficial. The other thing that we're learning through the work of Dr. Walter Longo, he's the world's premier expert on fasting and its relationship with cancer. He started with rodent studies, and he found if you fasted the rodents 24 hours before they got their chemo, they had less side effects and the chemo worked way better. Like if you look at that graph up on the top, chemo with fasting, that's the number of cancer cells. So the chemo worked way better when the patients were in a fasted state. And when you think about it, when you're fasting, those cancer cells need a lot of nutrients to be able to do all this division. All of a sudden you're not giving them what they need and they're kind of struggling then all of a sudden you hit them with this chemo and it like decimates them. So I always recommend that for patients that are undergoing chemo. 
they can at least, if they don't want to fast, they can, you know, calorically restrict. An easy way to do that is Dr. Walter Longo's group developed this five-day fast mimicking diet. It's called Prolon. You can get it on prolonfmd.com. And it's basically, it comes in a, in a box and you just, every day you eat what's there. It's basically a plant-based keto. Uh, it's about 600 calories a day. So I tell people do that for four days before your chemo, do it the day of the chemo. So if, if you don't want to like totally do juice fasting or water fasting, that's a good way to kind of approach it. Also, if you methionine restrict, that's an amino acid, uh, you can make the chemo work better. Cancer cells cannot grow without methionine. If you put cancer cells in a petri dish and you don't give them methionine, they'll all die. The best way to methionine restrict is a plant-based diet because all your animal products are in red, all of your plant products are in green. Plants have very low methionine levels. So that's the easiest way to methionine restrict. We're gonna talk about turmeric right now. How many people take turmeric? So a lot of you take turmeric, okay. I mean, I, I think everybody should take turmeric because it's, it's an amazing supplement. There have been over 12,000 studies done on turmeric and its relationship to inflammation and cancer. But one of the things, uh, and this is curcumin, uh, I think everybody's familiar with that. That's one of the primary uh, phytochemicals in turmeric, but it acts like all of these different chemotherapeutic drugs. I mean, this is one of the ones that I take, lenalidomide, and it's all over the place on here. So, um, so turmeric has an amazing effect against cancer. However, if you look at the root, the root has over 300 different phytochemicals. It has tumorone, zingarone, all these other phytochemicals. So in this study, they wanted to see what works better against cancer, turmeric or just curcumin against seven different cancers. And if you look here, turmeric worked better in every single cancer compared to turmeric, to, to just curcumin. So when I recommend a uh, turmeric supplement, I always go on Amazon, I always go consumerlab.com, try to find ones that are the highest quality, lowest price. This is the one that I presently take and I recommend for my patients. There's one gram of turmeric root in every capsule. So I personally take four in the morning, four at night. If you have cancer, you should be doing eight grams a day. And you should also be taking it with uh, a black pepper extract. On the right, studies show that when you combine it with uh, a black pepper extract, you improve bioavailability by 2,000%. So it's really important to do it with it. I also take fish oil. I take three in the morning, three at night. This is the one I take and get on Amazon. It's pretty inexpensive, but it's very potent. Um, that basically is giving me fat so that it absorbs, because turmeric will not absorb without fat. But also, I try to keep my inflammatory levels down, and fish oil is an amazing uh, omega-3 food that really will keep your inflammatory levels down. So I really think it's important to keep your, what's called, and I, that's a whole lecture, and we won't get into it, but your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Mine, when I check it, is 1.9 to 1. I try to keep people about 2 two to one, and I do that through the testing I do through uh, Quest, where I can measure that. So if you look at a turmeric supplement, it's usually kind of brownish, orangish. If you look at one that's standardized, 95% of curcumin, that's what most of them are, it's yellow. So I always go for the one that's more turmeric root. They're usually like way less expensive too, um, when, you, when you get it like that. And if you go to Whole Foods and you look at like turmeric root, like sitting in there, it's kind of more of a orangish brown rather than a yellow. But just kind of give an example how that works. So, so one of the themes today is variety, is really the spice of life. And this is further supported through what's called the American Gut Project. Um, Dr. Robert Knight is one of the premier researchers on your gut bacteria. And, uh, and we have about 37 trillion bacteria in our gut. I don't know if you know that. We have about 37 trillion cells in our body. And what he found in this study, they analyzed over 10,000 stool samples of people to see what the diversity of their gut bacteria was. And what they found was people that eat 30 different plant foods in a week have the healthiest, most diverse gut bacteria. People that eat 10 or less have a much less healthy uh, gut microbiome, 
and they have a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria where the people that eat 30 or more don't have any and it's probably because they're eating totally whole food plant-based. Because when you eat animal products, you are definitely ingesting some uh, antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. Now, what's in your gut? I told you, you have 37 trillion at least bacteria in your large colon. We have 17 carbohydrate digestive enzymes. Your gut bacteria have over 60,000 carbohydrate digestive enzymes. The difference between me and you is 0.1% as far as our genetic makeup. So we're all 99.9% percent the same. I don't care if you're black, Asian, or whatever. We're all 99.9% the same. However, the genes in our gut bacteria can vary by 90% depending on what we're eating. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, We also inherit the number of gut bacteria. So most people have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 different species of bacteria growing in their large colon. Let's say your mother your grandmother had 1,200 different species in her colon. She ate a crappy diet. She took all kinds of antibiotics. By the time she had your mother, she only had 900. Then your mother, she started with 900. She ate a crappy diet. She took all kinds of antibiotics. She had 600 when you were born. So you started with 600. So the thing is, you can increase the number of bacteria. Most people don't realize Plant foods have their own microbiome. So when you eat, like when you eat an apple, I mean, there's hundreds of bacteria in that, in that, uh, that apple that contribute to your microbiome. So you can make your microbiome more diffuse, uh, more diverse, uh, and multiply the number of bacteria just by eating different plant foods and fermented foods also, like sauerkraut and uh, kimchi and things like that actually can increase uh, the amount of bacteria in your gut. So you basically have good bacteria, and you have pathogenic bacteria. You have about, Prevotella is kind of the heading group of the good bacteria, you have about 500 subspecies, and then you have Bacteroides, that's kind of the head group of the pathogenic bacteria, and you have about 500 subspecies under that. Uh, These good bacteria do all of these different things, I'm gonna get into those kind of one by one, but it's amazing what these gut bacteria do. Um, So, when you're eating, a, when you have a lot of good beneficial bacteria in your gut, what they do is they take the fiber because the fiber can't be digested by your enzymes in your stomach and your small intestine. It creates these short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Now I want you to remember butyrate. These are the most anti-inflammatory molecules I have ever studied in my career. I mean, they are amazing what they do, and they also feed the colon cells. There's a lining of colon cells, Uh, they feed those. The bad bacteria actually create what are called secondary bile acids, which have been proven to be carcinogenic. They create a lot of endotoxins, uh, create a lot of intestinal uh, permeability, and they increase TMAO, which we're gonna talk about uh, shortly. But this study recently came out, Um, Irvi Shaw published this through Sloan Kettering, And this really had the multiple myeloma community in buzz, because what it showed was that people that had myeloma, what I have, if they ate plant-based, they had very high butyrate levels in their stool, the short-chain fatty acid I told you to remember. They were able to stay in a complete remission much longer than the people that had low butyrate levels in their stool. So when I get on these myeloma sites, I'm always talking about plant-based and this and that. People goes in one ear and not the other. You know, hopefully this kind of woke them up a little bit that it really does have a significant effect on the way cancer progresses. Now this is the thing that blows my mind and I think this is a lot of the ways that having a lot of good bacteria actually give you a very strong immune system. 70% of your immune function is controlled by your gut bacteria. They're basically the conductors of your immune system. So if you look on the top, uh, on the right-hand side, they're all your bacteria. They basically send signals through the one layer of colon cells, and they tell all your different white cells what to do. They tell your B cells what to do. They tell your T cells, your T T helper cells, uh, where to go, how hard to fight, 
If the inflammation's getting out of control, like with autoimmunity, it tells the T regulatory cells, hey, you need to kind of tone things down. So these bacteria wow. in our gut actually control 70% of our immune function. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. This is another thing I learned that kind of blew my mind. Has anybody ever taken a serotonin uptake inhibitor? It's an antidepressant. So serotonin is like a happy hormone. So when you take an antidepressant, it increases the amount of serotonin like in your bloodstream, so it makes you feel like less depressed. 90% of your serotonin actually comes from your gut bacteria. And 50% of your dopamine comes from your gut bacteria. They're both happy hormones. They both put you in a good mood. And that's why if you look at studies, people that eat more plant-based have better moods. They have better brain function. The other thing is, if you look up at the top, that's brain-derived neurotrophic factor. These short-chain fatty acids, the butyrate, the propionate, acetate, it actually crosses your blood-brain barrier and increases the amount of what's called brain-derived neurotrophic, uh, brain neurotrophic factor, which increases the number of brain cells that you have and also the interconnections between your brain cells. So it, it helps maintain uh, your cognitive function. This one's gonna totally blow your mind. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is kind of the area that I've like, I've kind of like taken a deep dive in because the more I learn, the more I'm kind of blown away. This study has been repeated hundreds of times and it comes out the same way every time. If you take identical twins, one's obese, one's lean, and you do a fecal transplant into rodents, like rats. If you take the obese twin, you put the stool into the lean rat, the lean rat gets fat. If you take the thin identical twin, you do a fecal transplant into the thin rat, it stays thin, and vice versa. If you take the lean, yeah. obese, uh, the, the lean twin, put it into uh, an obese rat, it'll get thin. And you can do it between rats too, it happens every time. The way it happens is that these, uh, these short-chain fatty acids actually control your PYY, your GLP-1, uh, your leptin. Many of you probably heard of this new weight loss drug. It's called Wagova, semaglutide. You see it advertised. It has a lot of toxic side effects, but it basically is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So instead of taking a dangerous drug, you know what? Just eat more plant foods and you're gonna increase your GLP-1 and you're gonna de it's gonna decrease your appetite. So that's basically how that works. It's kind of crazy. This is the last thing I'm gonna talk about uh, as far as the gut bacteria. Um, when you eat a lot of red meat, red meat has a lot of carnitine in it. We make all the carnitine we need in our liver. When you eat eggs, cheese, and certain types of seafood, they have high choline levels. And people that eat whole food plant-based get plenty of choline. You don't need to like eat all these foods to get choline. Uh, what happens is this carnitine and choline go down to your large intestine. There's a bacteria called Hungatello. Hungatello loves carnitine and choline. It starts forming this chemical called trimethylamine, TMA. TMA goes to your liver, it's converted to TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. And this work has been done through the Cleveland Clinic. And they show that TMAO causes all these problems, heart attacks, strokes, type two diabetes, metabolic disease. And a recent study showed that if you come into the ER with chest pain, if you measure the TMAO levels, you can pretty much predict that somebody's gonna have a heart attack in the next 30 days, wow. just by what the TMAO <laughs> levels are. So how do we increase our good bacteria and lower our bad bacteria? You basically do it by increasing your uh, plants, lower your animal products. Gut bacteria only feed on soluble fiber. Uh, insoluble fiber ma basically makes you go to the bathroom on a regular basis. So I recommend people eat a lot of soluble fiber. My wife and I, we eat uh, steel cut oats every morning with a bunch of berries and uh, soy milk and cinnamon. But you can change your mic your microbiome very quickly. This is a, a, a landmark study that was done in Nature in 2014 by David Lawrence, his group. They put one group on a carnivore diet and one group on a whole food plant-based diet. They analyzed their gut bacteria before the study started. In five days, the microbiome dramatically changed. The people on the plant-based diet had all these good bacteria increasing, bad bacteria decreasing. The carnivore diet, the pathogenic bacteria went up significantly and the good bacteria decrease significantly. So you can change that. I do microbiome testing uh, through my website. 
you basically go on there, um, they send you this kit, and I get results to find out how your microbiome is doing. Also, I do very extensive biomarker testing through Quest. I check vitamins, minerals, uh, heavy metals, your hemoglobin A1C, your insulin growth factor one. Uh, I check your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Um, I basically fill out a diagnosis code, and insurance pretty much covers this. Um, and then I also check for toxins uh, through your urine, through Great Plains Laboratory, and once again, I get the results and then I give you a chat, write you up a, a letter. Uh, if you wanna sign up for those, you basically go on my website, it's naturalinsightsintocancer.com. You, you hit shop, then you go to nutrient monitoring. If you want a virtual consult with me, you kind of circle virtual meeting. I do one or two hour virtual consults. The other thing I do that patients love I do 24-7 access to me through texting, email, and phone. And, and cancer patients love that. I used to not charge for it. People thought, felt like they were bothering me. I do charge $20 a month. My web designer thought that was way too cheap, but I said, listen, this is a, this is a passion project for me. But I get probably about 35 text messages every day from cancer patients. Like, hey, I saw this study. What do you think of it? What do you think of this supplement? Hey, here's my lab work. Do you mind looking at it? Sometimes they just need some moral support. So yeah. patients really like that. And this is my Instagram site. It's called Cancer Veggie Doc. I have over 36,000 followers and I do a post every day. And you can get my book either on my website or on Amazon. It's an audible Kindle hardback paperback. So just want to thank you um, very much. Hope you learned something. Oh, hey, my second standing ovation. All right. <laughs>